Hello, and welcome to this week's CircuitPython Weekly. We experienced some technical difficulties with audio. Only my audio is available through status updates. Please see the accompanying notes document for the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, and everyone else's hug reports. Everything from status updates on is available as usual. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for June 15th, 2020. I'm Katni, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that runs on tiny computers called microcontrollers. This is the time of week that we get together to discuss all things uh, CircuitPython and beyond. Um, this meeting normally happens at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Mondays. Uh, and it is hosted on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at adafru.it slash discord. Um, it is uh, held in the CircuitPython chat channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting is recorded. We record both the chat channel on video and the voice channel on audio. And it is released as a video on YouTube and also available uh, to many podcast services. If you want to be notified of any changes in the time of the meeting, we sometimes move it to a different day if it falls on a US holiday, um, you can check out the CircuitPython channel on Discord and you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role. Uh, we usually ping them with changes. And as well, there is an iCal link that uh, goes to a calendar that we try to keep updated um, for your own future reference if you want to have that available. Uh, CircuitPython development is sponsored by Adafruit. Please support them by purchasing hardware at adafruit.com. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, which is a quick overview of what's going on with Python on hardware in the community. Uh, there is next is the state of circuit Python libraries and Blinka, which is a look at the entire project from a statistics point of view. We talk about it overall and then we talk about the individual parts separately, all of which uh, is just a by the numbers look so we know where we are with the project aside from what it is we're actually doing. Uh, next up is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to call people out for doing something good. Um, it is held as a round robin where the person running it will start and uh, will go through the list alphabetically and loop back around. If you are lurking, please let us know. Um, we are happy to have you in the meeting, but we will skip over you when it comes to the parts where people are talking. If you are text only, feel free to add your um, notes to the accompanying notes document, which was linked a little while ago in the CircuitPython channel. And uh, note that you are text only and I will read off those notes as I get to them. And as well, if you are missing the meeting and you want to provide hug reports, you can. Uh, this notes document is made available earlier in the week and is available to anyone who wants to add notes. And I will read off those who are missing the meeting in alphabetical order as well. So be aware that um, Sometimes if you're next, there may actually be someone else um, before you, and I will read those notes. Uh, the next section is status updates. Status updates is a chance to talk about what you've been up to since the last meeting and what you're going to be up to until the next meeting. So take a couple minutes, let us know about projects you're working on. Um, can be Python related, can also not be Python related. We wanna know what it is you're up to. Um, so that is also held as a round robin where the person running it will start and will go alphabetical and all the stuff about lurking and text only and notes applies here as well. And the last section is in the weeds, which is an opportunity for more long form discussions that may not fit into status updates. Um, there are already a few topics listed, which is excellent. If you have any topics, please list them ahead of time so that we're not waiting around to find out if anybody has um, a topic to contribute. And if something comes out of status updates that turns into a longer form discussion, we can shift it to in the weeds. Um, we'll make a note. And when you add a note, please add your name. And that way I can turn it over to you um, 
when it comes time for in the weeds and that sums up the meeting so with that let me get back to the top we'll take a time code and I will get started with community news CircuitPython Bluetooth BLE library support for desktop Python. Lady Ada has been trying out the new BLE CircuitPython library support for desktop. Having easy cross-platform Python support for wireless BLE has been a challenge for many years. Thanks to Dan Halbert's great work on the CircuitPython BLE IO and the Python Bleak library, we now have many of our CircuitPython BLE examples working on desktop Python. And that includes heart rate monitors, bike cadence sensors, thermometers, and more can be connected to Python. And there is a YouTube link and um, it is available on the Adafruit blog. Um, Geek Mom Projects created a new wearable. It's a NeoPixel bracelet powered by an Adafruit Gemma M0 using CircuitPython. Uh, <clears throat> Geek Mom Projects says, still experimenting with blending LED colors in semi-translucent resin. Now trying the technique in wearables, of course. The cuff bracelet contains two side-emitting LED strips facing opposite directions. The electronics are cast in resin from a mold off of Amazon. And there's a Twitter link for that. Next up, the CircuitPython plugin for the Atom editor has been updated with some awesome new features. And that's from Joseph Banks, who did a write-up on that. And that plugin is available for Atom if you download it um, through Atom itself, I believe. Um, you can get that and check it out. Uh, Cedar Grove Studios, or C. Grover in our chat, um, did a repair of a damaged heirloom clock using the original acoustic whistles and chime. Sound components are activated by servos and a solenoid. It uses an Adafruit Cricut plus Pi Badge plus RTC Featherwing and a custom I2C host PCB from Oshpark. And the code is in CircuitPython. You can check that out on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, web scraping in Python, tools, techniques, and legality. Kimberly Fessel discusses her excellent tutorial created for PyCon 2020 online titled It's L Officially Legal, So Let's Scrape the Web. And that's available on Real Py or that's the Real Python podcast. Um, if you have any hardware, uh, Python on hardware related stories or projects to share, please submit it to the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Um, all of this was taken from the newsletter. It is a short overview of um, a few things that are part of it and we're always looking for new stuff so anything you're working on it's best if you can do a write-up on a blog or post it to github um, we like to have something to link to um, images are great but um, being able to link to your twitter account or a post about it is even better um, and as ann says pull requests are great on github or email annb at adafruit.com and um, send in your uh, Python on hardware projects. And that is community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is an overview of the project uh, by the numbers. It goes through um, the project overall, and then and that includes CircuitPython and the libraries. And then we'll talk about the core separately, the library separately, and Blinka separately, um, which will give us an idea where things are at um, in terms of um, the numbers and uh, who's been involved. So overall, we have had 31 pull requests merged by 16 authors. Um, I'm looking to see names I don't recognize. Um, F.V. Zeppelin, uh, Jan H. Bade, and X. Orbit, I think, are names that I don't recognize. Um, so that means they're probably new contributors. And 12 reviewers. Um, and there's two new names on those as well. Um, I don't usually see Jim Bob Bennett or Code. Um, so that's excellent to see we have new reviewers. The more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. So that's amazing. Thank you to our new contributors there. And uh, in terms of issues, we had 14 issues closed by nine people and 19 opened by 14 people. Um, so we are currently net up, but that's fine. That's to be expected, um, especially with uh, all the changes we've been making lately. So overall, um, five, let's see, beta one was just released, I believe. Um, and 
um, feel free to download that, test it. Uh, it's as far as I understand it, um, has been fairly stable. Uh, there's a lot of new features in it. Um, the best thing that you can do is to download it and try it on your current projects and then give us feedback based on that. You don't have to do anything fancy or special to help out with, um, to help out with testing. Uh, just using it is an excellent way to do that. And then if you find any problems, file issues on uh, the CircuitPython GitHub repo. In terms of the libraries, we've been um, finally seeing some new libraries again, now that there's new hardware uh, being manufactured again. Um, so that's been good to see. And uh, it was also nice to have some time to go through and kind of um, do some house cleaning as well. Um, so since we had time to do that, that was excellent to get that done also. Um, and more boards are being added all the time to Blinka, which is excellent to see. Blinka is our um, CircuitPython compatibility layer for single board computers like Raspberry Pi. Um, and we are supporting more and more single board computers, so that's been excellent as well. And also recently added support for Display I.O., which has been amazing. And I know that there's some more work to be done on that. That was a, that's a huge project. Uh, but Melissa has been rocking that out. So thank you very much for that. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. All right, thanks, Scott. Next up is the libraries. Um, in terms of the libraries, and this is across all CircuitPython libraries, there were 25 pull requests merged by 12 authors, um, including the names I mentioned earlier, and 11 reviewers, uh, leaving us with um, 37 open pull requests. We um, of the ones we merged, many of them were, were brand new, so we've been doing really well and staying on top of that. We had 10 issues closed by seven people and 12 opened by eight people for 178 open issues. Um, all this information is available on circuitpython.org slash contributing. If you are interested in contributing, reviewing uh, PRs is a great way to start. Um, circuitpython.org slash contributing has a list of open PRs um, a list of open issues and a list of library infrastructure issues, all of which are um, searchable and uh, will give you um, some good places to start, especially if you're looking for um, good first issues. If you are a beginner, um, those are available as well. And so uh, please take a look at that if you want to get started contributing to the project. Um, all the information you want to know for the libraries is available there. Um, in terms of library updates in the past seven days, we've had one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python SHTC3, and that is a new sensor. Um, and we had a number of updated libraries, uh, which I will not read off individually. Um, and that's where we are with the libraries. So with that, I will hand it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka.
All right, excellent. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, next up is Hug Reports, which is the exact opposite. Um, this is not a statistical overview of anything. It is, in fact, us taking the opportunity to call people out for doing something good. Um, it is held as a round robin. I will start and then go down the list alphabetically. If you are lurking, I will skip over you. If you have notes in the document, um, I will read those off and um, in order alphabetically. And if you are text only, I'll read it off as I get to you. Um, if you're missing the meeting, um, I will read off your notes as well. So with that, I will, um, I will get started. Um, first up, a hug report to Stargirl for becoming a community moderator on Discord. It's always great to have more people involved with that. Um, to everyone involved with the move to uh, the main branch and in removing everybody involved in removing loaded language from the circuit Python project overall. Um, thanks to everybody who's doing that. Um, thanks to Jeff for taking notes today and running uh, status updates. A hug report to Phil for being really supportive last week and for an important conversation. Um, to community moderators for handling a particular situation last week. I appreciate it and to Adafruit for continuing to be vocal and active in support of Black Lives Matter and trans rights. And uh, KJW is lurking, so next up is Maker Melissa. All right, thank you. Um, Mark is lurking, so next up is Summersoft. All right, excellent, we'll take it. Next up I have notes from Stargirl, who is offline for the meeting. Um, Hug report to Tan Newt for being a guest on Python T and to the moderators for allowing me into their gang. Next up is Scott. All right, thanks, Scott. Next up, I have Brent, who is text only. Um, hug report to Jerry N for looking into reducing the size of the Feather M0 radio build. And a warm welcome to Stargirl, to the community moderators, and a group hug to all. Carter is lurking. Uh, next, I have notes from C. Grover who says, to a hug report to the Adafruit team and leadership for their visible commitment to and demonstrated examples of thoughtful and energetic social responsibility. And next up is Dan. All right. 
So I have a couple of lurkers and then I have some notes from David Gloud. who says a hug report to Dan H for the BLEIO on Raspberry Pi and other Blinka boards and to maker Melissa and Dan H for the web Bluetooth learn guide. Um, let's see, Dylan is lurking. So next up is foamy guy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next up is Higher Effect. All right. Thank you. Couple of lurkers. So next up is Jeff. Next up is Jerry. All right, thanks. And that is Hug Reports. Um, which means it is time for status updates. And for that, I will hand it over to Jeff. And that is Hug Reports. Next up is Status Updates. And for that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Hi. Status Updates is the time for us to uh, let others know what we've been working on over the last week or so, what we hope to work on this week. And then, if you like, something fun that you're doing uh, with CircuitPython or just anything else you want to tell the community about to get a little bit of that social connection that we are uh, all looking for. So um, what I did last week is uh, I'm working on an SD card interface called SDIO for the SAMD51 microcontrollers. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make any visible progress. Um, it's a little bit stuck. But when uh, I was feeling stuck, I worked on some other things, uh, namely renaming stuff in the CircuitPython core, particularly around I2C and SPI bus names. 
And I also worked on improving the documentation so that read the docs would work better when you go between the 5.0 docs and the latest version uh, so that there are fewer or hopefully no 404s. This week, I'm continuing on SDIO. Uh, after talking to Lamore, I have some additional approaches that I will be using to try and figure out why I'm not successfully communicating with the SD card. And uh, hopefully that comes unstuck soon. And a uh, topic carried over from last week, I still need to get back to a pull request to add web late links to the circuitpython.org contributing page. And as far as fun stuff goes, um, I love these little CharliePlex LED displays. So I tossed four of them on um, with a uh, CircuitPython board and a real-time clock. And now I've got a little clock. I want uh, to add some dimming code so that at night it isn't blinding. And I want to create a 3D printed enclosure. Um, and also, I'm about to order a bunch of shelving uh, to store my growing collection of electronics. My office clutter is getting way out of hand. And with that, I will turn it over to Jaron, or Jerry, as he's known to his friends. Hi, uh, I answered him many names. Um, uh, let's see, so I spent a lot of time last week trying to find a way to freeze uh, the RFM9X library and bus device into the Feather M0 RFM9X build. Uh, some uh, a user particularly had run into a real problem trying to run an old guide that used, used those. And it's it's, it's really hard. <laughs> I, I, I've not successfully gotten it to build uh, or to build a fit. Um, Circuit Python has just grown an, enough, and the library has grown a lot. So I'm not sure what to do about it, if anything. So you can talk about that later, maybe in the weeds. And um, and then I've also been working on trying to reduce the size of the RFM 9x library, just seeing if there's stuff in there. And there, and there clearly are some things. I I found a couple hundred bytes pretty quickly, but you know, it takes up about 15K of, of memory when you load it. And uh, so a few hundred bytes is not the problem. Um, it'd be nice to, to fix up what we can, but in the long term, I, I again, it's not, not very encouraging. Um, <clears throat> I just thought I'm going to try and do some more reviewing than I have been. Um, tried to, I did some this week and uh, try, and, try and really spend more time in reviews. Um, it's kind of fun to do and just, uh, I just haven't, haven't, just haven't been doing it as much as I should be, or would like to be doing it. And the big news is my baby birds all grew up and they left. Them. So um, they uh, this morning they all fledged. I'm posting a picture now of uh, the uh, one of the mom. I don't know if it's a mom or a dad bird, but the <laughs> can't tell them apart. These are tufted titmice. Um, there's one of them, and you can see in the in the window of the birdhouse there. One of the birds is looking at little babies, is looking out. But they all climbed out and flew off to the trees today, all seven of them. And uh, it's fun to watch. It's been, it's been a great project over the last couple of weeks, watching them hatch and, and, uh, and fly the coop. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. What's up with you, Katni? All right. So last week, I uh, started a guide for three boards in one guide. Um, they're all ST, 9 off combo boards. Um, they are pretty much the same thing um, with slightly different variations, so they all kind of go together and the same code works. The guide's nearly done. I need to do the lib install and code examples on the code pages for both Arduino and CircuitPython. Otherwise, the downloads page is done. There's two different pinouts pages, overviews done, and then printing diagrams for both Arduino and CircuitPython are already in place. Um, I did the newsletter video, and um, I also brought Dylan up to speed on creating a project guide for his first full project. He's done a number of guide pages, but he hasn't actually done a full guide yet, so that's something he's working on, and I worked with him uh, to get him ready for that. This week, today's Library Monday. Um, tomorrow is newsletter vid. Uh, Wednesday, or um, possibly today, uh, finishing the guide. And then um, for the next few days, it's going to be um, going through tagged PRs or doing um, doing miscellaneous uh, stuff, just whatever's on my list, because um, there's always misc to be done. And that's um, as we're heading into more um, hardware being manufactured, uh, there will be more guides. But for right now, 
I will just be picking up whatever's left. Thank you, Katni. Uh, KJW is lurking, but leaves a note. Last week and this week, working on a game for an Adafruit guide using BLE advertisements. And that brings us to maker Melissa, who's been working furiously to finish up her notes in the document. Uh, I was just adding a little last second thing. Uh, so the last week I focused on display I.O. for Blinka. I tested out the drivers for all the color displays, including the bonnets and uh, breakout boards and everything. Uh, and I updated the repos to publish to PyPI. I added uh, rotation and some basic backlight support, and I added some changes to work with some of the odd displays, like the SSD 1331. Uh, this week, I'm going to be uh, working on switching gears and working on creating a uh, calibration script for the 9 dot feather wing that runs on the top. Uh, if I can do so, because it can be connected to this different connector. And then after that, I'll probably be working on some GitHub PRs and issues after that. Uh, for fun stuff, I'm working on an animated RGB message board with the matrix panels, and it'll be powered by a uh, Raspberry Pi and running uh, Python. Uh, and uh, it's currently lots of 3D printing for it, so I'm kind of like coming up with a mounting system for everything. That's it. Yeah, we can hear the 3D printer just a little bit. I got two of it was, right now. <laughs> all right, yeah. It wasn't too distracting. Okay. Uh, Stargirl is offline, uh, but left us notes. She says, oops, I'm a moderator. Uh, got hostess SPI up to 8 megahertz with a little DMA magic. Looks like it might actually be viable after all. I'll be open sourcing everything once I have a chance to clean it up a bit and will consider some sort of production run. Had a really good conversation with a very popular YouTuber about Winterbloom CircuitPython powered Eurorack modules and started prototyping a new synth module inspired by the Roland Juno 60. And that brings us to Summersoft. What's up? Hello. Um, so I wasn't in a meeting last week, so I got two weeks. Um, so for the last two weeks, uh, with Rosie Pie, um, I finished cleaning up and syncing the various repositories, and they have all now been moved underneath the CISA CI organizational uh, repository on GitHub. Um, I also got, um, I've been looking at switching the, the testing framework, I guess you could call it, uh, to use PyTest instead of my own hand rolled version. Um, so I got a PyTest plugin written for that. Um, so that Rosie Pi will now accept just standard Pi test um, tests, you know, as they're written, which look like this basically. Um, once I got that done, I uh, wrote about six of these in a matter of minutes. Um, so that was pretty pretty easy, and I think it was a really good idea to move to that. Um, if I can pat myself on the back. <laughs> Uh, outside of that, um, I worked on some possible enhancements to the documentation um, in collaboration with, with Foamy Guy. Um, they were the one that brought it up in the issue. Um, basically, when you look at the older versions of the documentation, it gives you this little warning, but that warning disappears if you scroll past it. Um, so got a way to just kind of keep it up at the top, and then um, somebody had mentioned putting up a, a way to hide it, and a uh, foamy guy had, had, had done that. Um, it hasn't been set in stone yet, and there's no PR for it. Um, I just need to work out how the older versions of the documentation are getting built on Read the Docs, uh, because the way it looks now, they aren't actually using any of the static you know, style sheets that are included. Um, so more to come on, on that, I guess. Uh, I also did some research on how to automate changing from the uh, default branch from master to main. Uh, Katni had asked me about it. It's pretty straightforward um, up to the point of setting a new default branch. Basically, you just do the same things you would do in Git. Push a new, you know, push a new branch to the, to the repository, and then you can use the GitHub API to set that as the default. Um, the problem is, is there's no way via the e the API to delete a branch. 
um, at least that I have found yet. Uh, the, the GitHub had mentioned that they are actually looking to change um, the, their default from, from master to something else. Um, I think Git itself is also looking at it. Um, so maybe an endpoint will become available, but at this point I can't see it. Uh, and then for some non-code related stuff, I had some family in uh, over the weekend for some sun, sand, and food. Uh, so I got, it was good to get a, a bit of a recharge and step away and get random sunburns uh, on different parts of my body. Um, I'm done with the spray on sunblock. Yes, it's not as messy, but it just doesn't work from a coverage standpoint. So uh, for this week, um, I, I need to get the new PyTest based stuff uh, pushed up to the repository so that I can then start testing it and see how it works on a Raspberry Pi. Um, up to this point, it's all been on my, my laptop. So I need to make sure it, it works okay over there. Um, and then there are apparently some CSS errors on the Physics CI website when you look at it on Safari browser. So I'm gonna look into that. Um, I'm gonna try and get some of the, uh, uh, some working code down um, for automating the, uh, the branch name switch. And then I need to give some attention to a couple of Adobot things that I have not been paying attention to and then whatever else comes up. Thank you. Uh, just one question about the um, branch renaming. Can you just invoke git push in the way that deletes a branch, or is invoking git commands uh, not the way you want to go on doing these things? Well, so for the initial one, yes. Um, basic, or for creating the main branch, that's basically what it'll be. It'll be download the current master, you know, git checkout b main, git push mm -hmm. main, and then from that point, you you would switch to using the API to to make the main branch the default branch, right? Mm -hmm. But deleting the master branch on the repository in GitHub, you can't, as far as I know, you can't do that from Git. There's a way to invoke Git push to delete a branch. So maybe I don't, I don't know if the question is yeah on the remote. Okay, well but I can look at that. That's if that's a way okay. to do it, yeah, we can look at that. I also okay. wanted, there is a subtlety around making the new branch that I didn't realize until I read Scott Hanselman's article about it, but you want to do branch copy because then you can, uh, then you copy all of the history of where the branch is pointed. So you, you copy the ref log as well. Okay. So. Yeah, I hadn't read. I I saw the I saw the blog post, but I hadn't read it yet. Um, yeah, I didn't realize it until I looked at that, and I was like, "Oh, that makes sense." Like, you want to store the history, right? Okay. All right. Well, if there's any more, we should probably take it in the weeds. So I'll turn it over to you, Scott. Yeah. Um, okay. So for my status update, I added ESP32 S2 UART support. I only tested receive, so if you try transmitting and it doesn't work, uh, let me know. I released beta 1, uh, which is exciting, and we got lots of new localization stuff uh, in there, along with the very first parts of the ESP32 S2 and a number of other things. Um, I took a look briefly at the SH1107 driver, which is an OLED. Uh, it was teased by Lamore. It's a, it's a Feather OLED that's 128 by 64. Um, it's going to take some core work because there's some weird bit math, bit like, so there's some weird things it does, <laughs> a couple of weird things. So it's going to take some, some kind of like quirks modes. Um, so yeah, that's in the back of my brain. It's not super urgent, so don't get too excited about that. Uh, it'll come, but uh, not anytime soon. Uh, and then on Friday, I streamed for an hour and recapped everything, uh, and then also uh, did Python T with Nina, which I think I did post a link to, and hopefully that works. Um, but she's also planning on putting it on, on YouTube. Um, I've been pretty distracted by this election calendar stuff, um, which I think I have here twice, um, because I think it's impactful and it's kind of urgent in my mind as well. But uh, I think I've got some 
space to do that outside of work time. So I should be able to focus on Spy this week. And I also need to uh, test the resistor and capacitor circuit that I'm hoping to store one bit of data in so that we can do double tap for bootloader. Uh, the problem with that is that the the reset line on the ESP32-S2 is actually a power enable line. So uh, when you hold the reset button down, all your memory lo uh, state is lost. So uh, we can't do the trick like we can on the SAMDs and, and other boards. Um, so looking at adding a little bit of supporting circuitry to be able to do that. Um, and the sooner I do that, the more likely it is to make it onto any hardware that's made. So that's something I'm do definitely doing this week. And then lastly, my fun stuff has been uh, Age of Empires 2, uh, because that game is still being worked on and still being improved, even though it's like two decades old. So um, yeah, going to play more of that. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Anecdata and Anne are lurking, but I have notes from Brent, uh, who says, uh, no, wait, I've gotten all the way back to Hug Reports. Pardon me. Um, so uh, Brent has nothing CircuitPython related last week or this week. I uh, hope that means doesn't mean you uh, have to spend all your time in Arduino, because that would be a drag. Anyway, enough editorializing. Uh, I have notes from C. Grover who completed the wooden enclosure that we heard about earlier for the hybrid cuckoo clock project powered by CircuitPython and two custom libraries. There's also a special Oshpark PCB in there that powers a Pi badge from the Feather Cricket Wing, Cricket Feather Wing, pardon me, whilst providing the X-squared C-Link. After a few timing adjustments, I hit it on top of the bookshelf in the library in order for it to be heard and not seen. If you recall, the acoustic components came from a damaged heirloom clock. The original clock was consistent, a consistent and soothing presence in my spouse's childhood home and now has brought the lost past into the present. And I don't know if we got the video link earlier, so I'll just paste that in to the chat again. Uh, the demand within the family for the Clock Minima large LED clock project increased to the point that a custom PCB is needed to streamline the build. The first boards arrive tomorrow from Osh Park, and if working, will leave for their new homes by the end of the week. I'll post project photos after that. This project was inspired by JP's Metro Minimalist Clock. Hoping to stop making clocks at some point and get back to some music projects. Non-circuit Python, replacing the Windows box with an iMac, the final stop, the final step to reduce the recording studio's footprint and complexity, a mostly wonderful experience. Use the transition to weed out what was once important, re-ripping the CD library as well. Do I really need to keep that version of the Song of the Barefoot Mailman. Uh, and that brings us to Dan. OK. So um, last week, I finished the bleak re-implementation of BLEIO for use on host computers. And I've tested it. And uh, Lamore has tested it on various BLE peripherals, like car rate monitors and barbecue thermometers and so forth. It works only as a central, so you talk to peripherals with it. I also tested it on, um, so I tested it on Windows and Linux, including Raspberry Pi, it works fine. Um, Mac OS, there are some issues with um, some limitations of bleak right now on Mac OS, but they're kind of under active discussion in that repo, so hopefully that'll get fixed and it'll start working on Mac OS soon. Um, while so that's that was kind of the major thing that I finished, and I'm waiting awaiting some reviews. So before so you'll see a, re, a release uh, soon. Um, and then I'm now in the process of fixing one or two uh, nits that I noticed in the the native BLEIO implementation when I was trying to re-implement it in Python. Um, after I finish this kind of stuff sort of the cleanup work and the last, the review, whatever review fixes I need to make. Uh, the next thing I'll do, uh, which we just talked about today, was that we'd like to do the same kind of thing, re-implement BLEIO, -E and this time using the ESP32, not the ESP32 S2, just the original ESP32, which has its own Bluetooth implementation. And it would be nice to, again, use BLEIO as a wrapper around that. And it's not clear at this point 
whether that should be um, uh, a C implementation or a um, Python implementation, but that's to be decided after I look at it some more. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have next some notes from David Vloud, who says he tested the Featherwing Enviro Plus from Pimeroni for compatibility with CircuitPython 5. Seems to work for most examples, except maybe two. Wrote a jiggle the mouse to keep the PC awake that does it simultaneously in VLE and USB as I use two computers to telework, uh, but failed to appear as a mouse twice in VLE. Dan gave some hints on how to do that. Tested clue to microbit communication using uh, code found in the newsletter. Non-circuit Python related, tried Citrix VDI on a Pi 4. I could do teleworking with a Pi. And a mandatory physical back to office once a week, starting tomorrow, frowny face. Um, Dylan is lurking, so that brings us to Foamy Guy. All right. Um... Last week, um, uh, last week, my uh, tile map game guide, the review got finished on that, and that was published. So I was uh, really excited about that. Um, my, uh, I had made a uh, an order for made a proof back uh, once I learned that they were taking orders again, and that arrived. So I got all uh, kinds of goodies to play with the weekend and throughout this next week. Um, uh, over this weekend, I was working on adding uh, support for the Pi portal to the Pi Badger. As well as adding uh, MP3 playback functionality to the Circuit Playground library, um, although it does only work on the uh, on the Circuit Playground Bluefruit, I later uh, figured out. Um, uh, looking forward to next week. Um, I'm still interested in poking around with the Playground library a little bit. Um, basically, the the core issue I want to try to solve is that the library uh, takes a hold of the speaker enable pin and it makes it so that user code um, can't access it, which makes it hard to mix and match um, code that does use the library with code that doesn't, especially around, uh, obviously, the, the audio playing and the speaker and everything. So I think there must be an easier way um, to do that. I just need to poke around a little bit and figure it out. Um, I also, uh, as I was working on the Pi Badger support for the Pi Partle, um, it, it thought crossed my mind that um, It'd be relatively easy to add uh, that support as well, uh, at least I think, for the QQ N4, and also possibly the Halloween and the Circuit Playground Bluefruit with the Gizmo. Uh, those two devices have the same screen as the Clue, which is supported by that library, I think. So I'm um, going to try to work on uh, adding a couple other devices to that library this week. And then uh, the last thing on my plate is uh, one of the items in my Order was one of these uh, little breakout microphones, uh, Max uh, 9814, um, which I think has got some, some sort of its own amplification and filtering and stuff like this going on. Um, and my goal is to try to use it with uh, the TensorFlow Lite, the yes-no um, listener, and then ultimately transition, transition that into a, like a little HID device that will send keystrokes into uh, a different system. That way, we can have a way uh, to input into a system without having to touch a touch screen or buttons or anything like that. But that's all I got for this week. Thanks. Sounds like you'll be keeping busy. Um, all right. Higher effect. What's up? All right. So this past week, I added uh, tightly coupled memory support to the uh, for the H7, but um, just because of some complications that happened around there, I think just a couple of bugs came up. Never made it in for the F7, but it's in there now, so that'll be a lot faster. Um, I added in, uh, I, I tested a uh, control for the RGB matrix, um, which I'm adding 7 and 8 7 support for. And um, I didn't get it 100% working, which may mean that there's some more recent bugs, possibly related to clock stuff. So uh, I'm going to be checking out this that out this week. Um, and I worked a bit on i squared c for the um, TM32, uh, again, F7 and H7, uh, which had some incorrect values. Um, had some discussions with Scott about that, um, and uh, hopefully that'll be wrapped up soon and have nice i squared c timings across the board. Um, this week I'm going to be continuing work on RGB matrix. I'm going to be working on 
using the uh, INX1050 to the IMX port. Um, and uh, if things go well, I'll be working finally on Pulse IO for the IMX. Uh, that's it for me. All right. Do you still want me to put together my uh, RGB mains and the STM32 Feather, or uh, are you, well, do you want me let to me, still do let, that? Let me try and, and narrow down that issue first. I, I um, tried it with the M4 with the jumpers and everything. Like, I, I, I actually did a true recreation with the M4 Express, um, mm -hmm. and I don't get any glitches. So it does, okay. it does definitely seem like it's a software issue. Uh, on not just the uh, on on the STM32 at 405. Um, uh, I don't need any more help uh, confirming it. I think it's pretty. Okay. Um, yeah, just let us know if you need help from me for any reason. Um, Thank you. Jacob is lurking, so that has brought us through the whole list. Uh, so that concludes status updates. Thank you, everybody. It's fun to hear from you what you are up to. Now we're ready for In the Weeds. Katni, do you want me to run that, or do you want to take it back? Uh, you can go ahead. Great. Uh, so In the Weeds is a time for longer form discussion. If you've got some kind of uh, time-based requirement to get out of here, please feel free to. We've been at this for an hour. But um, we do have some topics that people would like to discuss. If you have an additional topic, go ahead and add that at the end of the list so that we're not sitting here just waiting to find out if uh, we're done or not. So with that, I will hand it off to KJW. Um, hello. Um, hello. I, I've been working on um, a game recently using a Bluetooth uh, low energy advertisement packets. Um, and I suppose during that I've you know, I've been doing some stuff with sort of protocols and sequence numbers and things, and um, and I noticed a certain degree of loss, which I initially assumed was just because of flaws in my sort of code. Um, I, I've I started noticing them more, and this afternoon I actually wrote some code, which is very simple and just does a start advertising to send packets um, and does a start scan to listen for them. Uh, and it really does actually show that um, sometimes when you've got devices um, that are all simultaneously sending and receiving, uh, you can end up with um, actually no packets heard from one device um, in a 30 second period. Um, so it seems, and other devices do hear the data. So it does seem that something is uh, potentially wrong somewhere. Um, it could also be that there is just some other limitation of ELE that I don't understand, but um, <clears throat> I've, I did a lot of tests this afternoon. I've graphed them up and put them in a forum post um, so you can kind of see graphically what goes on. Um, just actually, I can put that in the, there's a big PNG of it. I don't know what it, Discord will do with it, but that's the, that's the file from the, Discord going to do with it? Oh, there you go. So that might let you zoom in. <clears throat> so in essence, that's um, I've, there I've got four devices chattering away um, at the same time. Um, and I mean, you know, initially you look at it and there's a lot of variability. So, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not. The real problem is sometimes you've got four devices that are all transmitting and each of those stacked bar graphs should have some level of reception of three of the other devices. Uh, and you've got some cases where you've got a 30 second period where you only hear two of the devices. Um, ELE seems to have a feature built into it, which has a, a sort of jitter where it adds zero to 10 milliseconds on advertisements to stop uh, two devices sort of accidentally transmitting at exactly the same time and sort of in lockstep. Um, so yeah, what I see I think shouldn't happen. Um, so I, I've put the simple code in the forum post. Um, there's the graph of what actually happens. And uh, I suppose the first question would be if uh, can other people reproduce this? Um, I don't think there's any particular environmental issues. Um, I mean, I live in quite a sort of a dense um, sort of Wi-Fi rich and BLE rich neighborhood, but um, I don't think these are, 
I don't think this is what you would see just from kind of what you might call jamming. So my take on is it on it is that I, I've done a little bit of this too with the broadcast net stuff, and the reality is is that like advertising is unreliable, and you're never gonna not see anything. Um, but if you're concerned that there's actually a bug in CircuitPython, I would encourage you to run the same sort of test with like the Arduino implementation to see if you see the same pattern. Um, they're both built on the Nordic soft device, but it's also possible that it's a soft device bug. So by like experimenting with what code you're doing these tests in, um, could inform where we think the bug is. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like a lot of work to get a, a little bit better rather than than a lot better, I think. Yeah, I, I um, yeah, I agree. The Arduino is a good place to start for a comparison. Um, I just think there is something wrong here. Uh, it'd be interesting if if there's other people as well. Um, is the um, do you think there's sort of uh, is the is it worth posting to that Nordic forum? I I, I think you would. They would just want more data. Right, and they would, and they would want a, a reproducible example that is written in C or something like that. So, I don't think you'll get a lot out of that necessarily. Um, like one thing you could do is you could take like a Nordic, one of the dev boards that has um, that you can use as a as a BLE sniffer, and see and just have it look at the traffic from a from a fourth party point of view to see what it sees to see whether this sort of deafness that you see is reflected by another receive only board. I wasn't particularly thorough, but I did have my tablet running um, during some yeah. of the tests and uh, that saw all of them. Um, but it's, it's not this. Well, I'm not sure what that's telling me. I mean, the other mystery. Well, that's, actually, that's I'm... good too. Could probably. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Go I mean, ahead. The, the, the other mystery on the tablet and I wasn't. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing. Is the, the devices actually seem to change um, the RSSI at the same time? You you know you get the stepping every five seconds, presumably as they're changing the channel they transmit on. So it was strange that I couldn't work out how four independent devices had, had all managed to synchronize themselves. Is, does that sound likely at all? I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether they're looking at. If they're seeing a lot of strong signals nearby, maybe they back off. Um, I don't know whether they listen and then they say like, oh, I'm in a very rich environment. I shouldn't transmit so loudly because I'll just drown everything out. So perhaps there's some adaptation going on, but I have no idea. Also, this this irregular, this deliberate um, jitter that's in, introduced, I mean, we ought to make sure that we didn't disable that accidentally or something, but um, it's also it was, true. Is it also true that the the deaf board, the board that seems to be deaf, it's not the same board all the time? Is that correct? I, I believe it varies. Yeah, right. Oh, okay. Okay. So I I I mean I would uh, I think we'd have to do a lot more experimentation to see and uh, using BLE advertisements in this way for a lot of data transfer between a lot of devices is really a kind of a, like there is BLE mesh, which uses this technique, but it probably has more sophisticated back off algorithms and stuff like that. So, um, it's not using the it's not just using straight advertising it's using some other mechanisms and probably other channels because there's only three channels here there's only three advertising channels so um if they accidentally get synced up they one could e even drown out another one maybe um but uh, i think it would require a lot more experimentation to figure out what was going on here it may or may not be a bug Okay, I'll have a look at how um, 
um, yeah, how easy it is to do any. I've not done any C BLE stuff, so I'll have a look at the Arduino stuff to see if that's trivial to do. Yeah, I mean, we we can. Um, I studied that in a lot of detail when I was working on the Python implementation. So, or the Circuit Python implementation, the native Circuit Python implementation. So, I help you, but there's a lot of examples in, in there that might help. Okay. I, I did wonder, I had a brief look around the forums to, if in case that, that um, jitter was disableable um, and I didn't really see anyone referring to it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think there's some, there's something very low level about whether you have the bias, some bias correction turned on, on the random number generator, but that was the only thing. And that was, that seemed to be more to do with what distribution you wanted, uh, how perfect you wanted it. So it didn't really sound like you could turn it off. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I, I did wonder if it was bad luck and if it was turned off and you happen to start transmitting at a similar time, that, that is a potential explanation. Right. Or whether it's another, when, you, when you're doing this, when the, the, the packet's heard on the, the deaf device, so-called deaf device, is it, do you have, or are you filtering it so it's not looking at other non- other devices, random other random devices that you have around. Um, to this one, um, I actually let it pick up everything. Um, so, uh, and you can actually see from the graphs, there's actually very little other traffic. Uh, you can barely see it on the graphs. It's the kind of pastel colors at the right at the bottom. Okay. Um, the the um, the Adafruit devices are not particularly sensitive, so on my desk they don't really pick up much. Uh, there is a little bit, and I think the clues are better than the. Uh, CPBs, the blue fruits, but uh, my blue fruits are the original, I think, alpha hardware as well, which I think there was a revision to the antenna design. Mm -hmm. Right. The antenna is smaller on the, yeah, on the CPB. Well, I think the revision on the CPB was power related, not, not antenna related, I thought. Oh, was it? Oh, I, 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 yeah, yeah I mean, like the the, there's a power smaller. MOSFET, power MOSFET that she added. Right, but the actual antenna is smaller too than the one on, say, the module, the feathers or something like that. Yeah, I mean, the only difference I notice is the clues pick up a tiny amount more kind of other stuff. That was just the, um, and actually, uh, oh, it's underneath actually. <laughs> the the uh, the gizmo is quite effective at blocking things as well. I think there's a lot of metal in that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it may be that the use case you have in mind is not, I mean, I think your use case is a lot of people in a classroom trying to talk to each other with this, or I wasn't uh, sure. Well, I was just trying to get my game to do broadcast between a few devices, uh, where a uh -huh. few two or like a few more people. And, um, and I just noticed these periods where I, I was kind of, it's kind of difficult as well when you don't have timestamps uh, that are synchronized. But the I, I was kind of thinking, why is this not receiving anything? Um, and um, so this is kind of why I went down this route and this investigation. Uh, and you know, I could accept, you know, maybe a second it may, may, might make sense that you know something is jamming it, but for thirty seconds it just seems kind of odd. Right. That so that might be some kind of genuine bug that somehow it's not really scanning. But I don't know why it would suddenly act better or worse. So I, I'll look at this, but I, I don't have any clear understanding of what. I would I limit limit that time because this is a rabbit hole, right? Like no, no, I'm not going like to spend me. any much time on this, right? Yeah, right. this is not a bug, right? So like, it, 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 yeah, like get getting that last bit working perfectly is a lot of work. A lot of work. Okay, uh, that's it for that um, topic from me, at least. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, I've written a lot of text, but it's really just a kind of. I'm just curious if if there's if anything has happened in the um, sort of SAMD21 space before. So uh, theoretically. You could start doing different versions of libraries um, for the M0 and the M4, or the you know small boards and big boards. Uh, I think there's a lot of downsides, you know, a lot of cost related to that. So I'm just curious if that's been considered in the past. 
it's been discussed and there's it's just simply too much overhead um there there's going to be situations where you can only run simple code because a library doesn't work um i think trying to have multiple versions of things you just you run into everything that goes into keeping both versions updated um you run into people using the wrong version still um things like that um so it's sort of been discussed but um the conclusion usually was that it's just not really a viable option okay that's fair enough i was just curious thanks yep yeah and i think our approach for the m0s is basically to like freeze everything so basically not add any more modules not add um anything significant to libraries that are used on it i think that's where we got into trouble with this lore example is it would be great for us to have a way to actually like test in a ci the the size of uh, of imports in a library because theoretically when we add more logic to a library we should both be able to tell what the memory Im impact of that is and figure out how to structure it in a way that uh, you import the code that you're interested in when you need it, not always. And uh, as we as Blinka gets more popular and we get larger and larger boards, we, we can't forget to kind of start from the lowest denominator rather than starting on those big ones because uh, it influences the way that you write a driver if you have a lot of resources versus not. Thank you, uh, Kevin and Scott and Dan. And I think that kind of uh, brings us smoothly. And Katni, oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, that kind of brings us into uh, Jerry's In the Weeds topic. So I will hand it to you, Jerry. Yeah, just following up on that, you know, it, it's come up many, many times now with some of these boards, especially the, the, the non express boards in particular, you know, the. Mm -hmm. The uh, specialized boards like the RFM 9X LoRa or this RFM 69, or I guess even the Adalogger, or, or you know, which you know, how hard do we, are we going to work to to keep these things use? I mean, they're usable in lots of ways. I mean, I I, I use uh, an RFM 69 LoRa for a very simple project. It's great for having a, a PIR sensor on it and a LoRa radio, and it you know it, mm -hmm. it, that that works fine, and it'll run all the basic stuff, but You've never been able to put a display on it, or been able to you know, put a sensor on with it, or else you're immediately out of out of memory. It's been that right. way for a long time. So you know, most of it, maybe it's just a question of going and scrubbing the guides and not in, not in discouraging people from using them. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, other than that, uh, you know, uh, or is it, you know, so is there any sort of official policy? Are you thinking you know really sort of discouraging and dropping support for these boards? Or just you know just you know have to be clear about what their limitations are, I guess. Right. I think I I think the general approach is that if we wrote a guide for it, it should still work, but we're not going to create new guides for it. So in that right. sense, like we're not going to add functionality and and show it off for those for those limited also, boards. But there but there clearly are, you know there are some guides that were written long ago that no longer work, like like this one with the Laura and the uh, weather station. It's been a long time since you've been able to put a BME 280 and a, and a LoRa radio together on, on an M0. Even on an M0 Express, I don't think you can do it. Right, and that's an example where we either need we we do have a precedence for retiring a guide. Right. Um, but again, I that doesn't mean it can't work. Right. Like it worked before. We should be able to figure out how to get it to work again. Um, well, I mean, if you put you know, version three point, you know, three of Circuit Python on it'll work. <laughs> but in other words, you know, um, yeah, uh, right. I mean, you could yeah. just just tell them to that. Right? Like, that is that so bad? Like just well, to I, say, hey, you should use the old version of Circuit Python because it's kind of an old feature of Circuit Python. Um, I, I I don't I wouldn't go that way, but. 
somebody else can. I, I, I would say don't use the board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair to just have a disclaimer. Um, I think we're starting to realize that there's more cases where you have to say that. Yeah, and I, and I think you know those boards are wonderful under Arduino, um, and 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 you know, and if you're if you're cognizant of the limitations, they have some really nice features to them, and you can use them. Right. You just really have to tone down your expectations. But I think you know the the example that came up was it was a pretty clear one. You know that that it's easy to go down the wrong path if people just look at the at the product some of the product guides and some of the guides because you know. You know, there's still a lot of stuff in there about M0 being, you know, designed for Circuit Python, and so, right. you know, yeah, it was, but <laughs> Circuit Python kind of grew out of it, yeah. <laughs> so, I, right, but uh, at the same, but at the same time, like the stuff that worked when we wrote those guides should still work, in my opinion. Right. Like, yes, but but like I said, that that guide was written under three. You know, Circuit Python was a lot smaller, and so were the libraries. So, you know, the current library, you know, we we've exp particularly RFM nine X. I know. I mean, we added a lot to it. Um, right. Now I, I'm still puzzled as to why it's as big as it is, and I think, like I said, I I can. There are some things I can get rid of in it, but. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, I think that's what it comes down to is providing better tooling to understand memory consequences. So Jerry, yeah. I just I just looked at it and the RFM X library is still a single file. So right. is there anything if you go back to when it worked on an M0 is there any basically what you could do I think is leave that in basically the so basically kind of model what does the CPX and the CPB do in that you have this this base class and it has the very minimal functionality. And then anything that you're adding beyond that where you're going to be able to use it on a larger board, then you put that in a in a separate module and import it as necessary or when available yeah. or when it's that, that, It's possible. And I tried, uh, actually, I tried, I tried making a, a, an RFM 9X light. Basically, I, I, I took out all the stuff I put in recently. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it, you know, and it, it made it smaller, but it's always been pretty big. I mean, even when it was right. before that. So, I mean, it did, I, I cut it down from, I think it, it takes, it occupies about 15K of memory when you load it right now. I mean, I, I probably cut it down to, you know, about a third of that or something like that. And and I actually was able to get it to, to build and freeze, but then I couldn't fit, um, I had to, in order to get it to go in, with, in into the flash, I had mm -hmm. to take math out. You know, that, that was useless because any of the sensors, most of the sensors, the, the, this example was written, was needed that. So right. I just couldn't get it to fit. Um, I ran into another funny thing, which maybe you can tell me right off the bat. I could not, on the RFM 9X build, if I took out USB MIDI, I could not get the REPL to get the CircuitPy circuit mm -hmm. to boot until to, to load. Is there a reason? Is that expected? Mm -mm. I could I could not get it to if I it would build mm -hmm. without MIDI, but it would not. I would never get a CircuitPython drive. You it, have to it, turn it, it off in two places. Ah. Uh, Where's yeah, the second turn it off in USB underscore devices and also turn it off circuit pie, whatever. Oh, okay. So I turn it in, I, I do it in the make, I just did it in the make file in the, um, in the, you know, the MP config file. You could, you, you, you do it, you do it there, but you have to turn off, you have to, to respecify the list of USB devices to remove the audio device. Mm, oh, for the descriptor. Where, yeah. Where is that? Yes. Uh, uh, you can just say USB underscore devices something so if you look for usb underscore devices you'll find some examples where we turned it off the other okay i'll take a look so all right so that made so it can make yeah. it a little smaller there um yeah so that you know then i might be able to get that to work with a you know so with the stripped down build in which case then then maybe there's hope that by splitting the library up it would be workable again so that maybe that's maybe that's a, a good goal is to see if we can break the library up into some smaller pieces um, mm -hmm. because ninety percent of the users don't need all the, the new stuff we put in. Um, mm -hmm. um, so it's a shame to have it so big. I also found that um, 
properties seem to take up, you know, they there's a lot of properties in those files and they each of those adds something when you make a property rather than just a function call. Does that make sense as well? Yeah, I mean the the property adds one layer of indirection on function calls, so there is like a 16 or maybe 32 byte block that you're allocating to store that. Okay. So, you know, you know, again, there is probably, you know, 15 to 20 properties and there's a lot of stuff in those. I so, mean, if the properties aren't used, we shouldn't have them there. Right. And that's what what I did like there was there was a property defined for, you know, some internal flags like rx done and rx transmit done. So I took those out because it, mm -hmm. it nobody you going use the user never sees those. It right. doesn't make any sense to any property. So scrubbing right. things like that it was also using a thing called warnings that was put in recently for the CRC check. That actually was a couple of hundred bytes. It, uh, so I took that out and just put a right. simple counter in to let you know that there were CRC errors. Little things like that. So yeah. I, I'll, I'll scrub the library over the next you know few weeks and see if I can get it down. That would be useful anyway. Yeah, and I think this is this is why I think my my larger term goal or feeling about it is like we really need better insight into the impact of all these small changes in terms of memory right. yeah um, so i think what that would involve is like being able to build a 32-bit you know ubuntu hostable thing where we could actually add a hook to just like memory dump the whole heap and then we can post process that like the scripts that i've done do so we'd be able to we be able to determine concretely like exactly how much memory everything is, and then also draw like a chart of the memory used from the import. Um, okay, I think it would be very helpful in informing of like, oh, we can't merge this PR because you added four hundred bytes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. Well, that's that's the other question that it, maybe I was trying to raise in the in the bigger discussion is that are we well you know. How cognizant are people being asked to be when you're writing new libraries? You know, most of the development work and testing work is being done on these bigger processors. Right. And so, you know, do we not want to put a new PR in or put a new library in if it won't run on an M0? I, I think that's something we have to think about. Right. And we're not thinking about it as much as we should be. Um. And but again, like I'm really bad about building every board because we have 100 plus boards. And in the same sense of like, I'm really bad about importing everything on all the different ports that we have. Like, we need yeah. a yeah, we need a CI solution for it. We can't just ask people to try it on all the different boards. Well, that's a, my biggest fear. I was trying to shoehorn this thing in to fit in the in the you know, in that board and realized, well, no way that the Chinese translation is going to make it if I get it to work anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Especially on those tightest boards, it really is a trade off about what we, what we value and what we want to include. Like I looked at it a bit for the, the nano, the Arduino IOT 33, where they had this PR of like adding the encryption chip support along with bus device and stuff. And, um, it, I just couldn't get it to fit. If 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 we want to replace anything that's commonly used in drivers, like we could look at making bus device native, and that would speed things up and reduce the memory and remove the dis remove the need to make it um, to have it frozen. So that's something we could look at as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks. I, I just wanted to get a sense as to what 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 direction you wanted to go with these things. I mean, I, to me, it feels the same, the same as why do iPhones stop working as they get older, right? I don't think there's much deliberately done at Apple to make them obsolete. I think it's simply that everyone working on them have has newer phones. And uh, that's a struggle to, to make sure that you don't, that you still look at the older stuff. Okay. Good. Thanks. Well, uh, thanks everyone for participating in, in the weeds. Um, thanks everyone for hanging in there.
uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. We are coming up on the hour and a half mark. Um, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for June 15th, 2020. Um, hopefully, at least part of this, if not all of it, will be posted to YouTube and podcast services. If not, we do have notes um, available for the meeting that you can read through if you're interested to hear what happened. Um, we will be back again next week uh, at the same time, uh, Monday at uh, 2 p.m., I believe, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. And if that changes, uh, we will definitely let you know as soon as possible. So with that, thanks everyone for participating. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.